Um, thank you. I'm sorry we're running a little over time, um, but uh, if you could settle down, we have our last speaker. Um, Leslie. Uh, and final speaker, uh, Professor Leslie Harris. Nope. <laughs> um, I'm very honored to be able to introduce uh, Leslie, um, especially because, like our very first speaker, Koki Roberts, if you saw her at Tulane, Leslie is a daughter of New Orleans as well. And she graduated. Behave. Um, she graduated from Ben Franklin High School. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, and she graduated with our late colleague Michael Mazel Nelson. So I, I feel like he's he's here with us a, as well. Let me just give you her biography and turn it over um, to Leslie. Um, she earned her PhD at Stanford University and is currently professor of history and African American studies at Northwestern University. Before going to Northwestern, she taught at Emory University, where she co-founded um, the Transforming Community Project to engage university the, the university community in the active recovery of and reflection on the history of race at Emory in Atlanta. She's the author of In the Shadow of Slavery, African Americans in New York City, eight, uh, 1626 to 1863, and co-editor of volumes on slavery in New York and Savannah. She's currently at work on a book on New Orleans that uses Hurricane Katrina and her family's history as a way to in interrogate the history of African Americans in the city from the 19th century to the present. Please welcome Dr. Leslie Harris. Well, it's truly an honor to be here this afternoon as a prodigal daughter. Thank you to the program committee and especially to Emery, Emily Clark for this three days of an intellectual movable feast. Thank you to the City of New Orleans 2018 Cultural and Historical Commission, especially co-chairs Priscilla Lawrence and Sybil Morial. It's been an incredible three days. So much history. Indeed, we are in a moment in the writing of New Orleans history where the city is finally taking its place as part of United States history a change that was taking place before Hurricane Katrina. As distinctive as this city is, it is also a part of this nation. That question of how much we were part of the United States was asked by both the city and the nation in 2005, and although there were some murky and disappointing answers at the end of the day, so to speak, I would say that the nation and New Orleans, no less Louisiana, found our fates and our futures linked. Historians, meanwhile, have continued to see New Orleans as part of the Atlantic world, but have also figured out how to talk about New Orleans and indeed the other French and Spanish North American colonies that ultimately became part of the nation. This weekend in particular, with its emphasis on all of the peoples who made New Orleans what it is, marks another very important moment in the writing of our history, the acceptance and discussion of some very difficult parts of our history that are nevertheless foundational to who we are, who we were, and thus who we are. From Native American removal to African enslavement, from the coerced importation of criminalized Europeans to the Europeans who became criminals after arrival, the, from those who made a fortune here to those who lost their lives, those who struggled against equality for all and those who struggled for the highest ideals of our nation, we have discussed it all this weekend and laid a foundation for more. This is how to chart a future with an honest account of our past, with an inclusive past. There is more work to be done. As our history moves forward, so must we. The migrations of the 70s and 80s, Vietnamese, Latin American, and others, we are still figuring out that recent history. And indeed, historians are like those of us with aging vision. We can't <laughs> quite hold that history far enough away for us to see it and get a clearer picture of it. But geographers like Richard Campanella continue to help us out, and maybe soon we'll find the right glasses to be able to tell those recent histories too. Now, much of the history we've heard about this weekend was begun before Katrina, or wasn't directly inspired by those events, although it may have changed somewhat in the aftermath. And I very much appreciated the perspective, perspective of Shannon Doughty, an archeologist, on the ways in which Katrina opened up the possibilities for that field. A pyrrhic victory, to be sure, but historical truths and artifacts are often only released close to a death. Historians and archeologists, unfortunately, are like that sometimes. 
But I must admit that my own investigations into the city were substantially changed by 2005. I always knew that I would someday write a book about New Orleans, my New Orleans, one which not, would, would not be about jazz or Bourbon Street or Mardi Gras, but would be about slavery and labor and the people I knew. It would spill some secrets about the real New Orleans, not just its public tourism face. Hurricane Katrina forced my hand, however. It made me realize that I needed to spill some personal secrets as well. I had to come to terms with my own troubled relationship to the place of my birth. I began thinking about the place I had left and my relationship to it days after Katrina when I wrote this email. Dear colleagues, family, and friends, I write to let you know that my immediate family is physically safe and we hope that much of my extended family is safe as well. My parents and my sister Regina and Regina's two boys, David and Reggie, are with me in Atlanta. My sister Jennifer, her husband Shane, and their two boys, Ryan or Devon, are with my husband's family in Houston. My youngest sister, Rachel, is in New York this fall at Columbia, starting a master's degree program in climate and society. She may save all of us one day. Unfortunately, our beloved home city is in dire straits, and it is, it is unclear when we, we will be able to return to it. I left over 20 years ago, but as any native New Orleanian will tell you, being from New Orleans is like being Catholic. You may leave the church, but it doesn't really leave you. I know that many of you natives or not are feeling a deep sense of pain and loss. As a New Orleanian, I wrote to my dear colleague and historian of Russia, Matt Payne, I knew there was always a chance that I would become part of the tribe from the lost city of Atlantis, and here it is. He responded to me with a stone of hope, carved out of a mountain of despair that it seems we might never scale. Dear Leslie, no, not Atlantis. Katez, the magical city of Russian folklore that was so beautiful that God submerged it in a lake to protect it from the Mongols. Its denizens still carry on underwater and are known for great merriment. Only the truly blessed can find the city and join the festivities. New Orleans, in its beauty, spirituality, and merriment, is Katez, and we'll all find our way back there. I come to you today as a prodigal daughter, trying to make sense of a future I turned my back on at age 18 and even earlier. For before the Katrina diaspora, there were others. In New Orleans, there were always those who left and those who stayed. I left resolutely, without hesitation, as soon as I could after high school graduation. Yet in the years after Katrina, I have found myself drawn back inexorably. Perhaps the days and weeks after Katrina of living with my parents and my sister and my nephews in the aftermath of the storm began to pull at me. Hearing the vocal rhythms of my childhood again, relatives and friends calling, leaving messages, French and Spanish last names, city streets that are nowhere else but here. My father's voice late one night repeating my mother's name into an annoying cell phone with an inflection I've never heard, will probably never hear anywhere else, the R rounded out to a slight oi from Merle to Merle. You, you know people talk like this. <laughs> he won't admit it, he can't hear it. My father again reading out loud an article about the fears of displaced people, fears not only about their homes but their culture, that they will lose the language they fought to preserve, not even New Orleans English but Louisiana French a French that I only heard in bits and pieces from my grandmother, but which lives on in other places in lower Louisiana. My nephew, noting that everything in Atlanta was uphill, and he's right, <laughs> reminded me of the gentler slope of the world in New Orleans. Slowly, these moments fell like tears on my stony heart, wearing away my resistance to the charms of this city, my anger at it to reveal my love for it. Still, it has taken me years Years to acknowledge how New Orleans has shaped everything I have. Years to accept the place of my birth as a place of pride. Years to accept my inheritance and the responsibilities that come with it, com complex as those things are. When I was in college in the mid-1990s, a friend saw a picture of St. Louis Cathedral, a popular poster of the time, a photograph taken of the cathedral at night, wreathed in mist and fog. You live in a place that looks like that? she said. She was from New Jersey. <laughs> I shrugged. So what? I thought. For these are the ways of children. Your mother is so beautiful. Your father is so handsome. 
Your parents are so nice, they're so much fun. You look just like your mother. You sound just like your father. When do we learn to embrace our parents and all that they have given us? When do we stop running away? In the days and weeks after Katrina, as I tried to make sense of the city I had turned my back on decades before, a city drowned and then drained, deserted and then very slowly re-inhabited, one image kept returning to me, not of Jackson Square or of the streetcar, not of the Garden District or flooded Lakeview and Metairie, not even of my parents' home, which we had looked up on a satellite photo and which I had tried to pretend was not standing in five feet of water. Rather, over and over, I thought of the drive through window at a Whitney Bank branch on Broad near Esplanade. Not a fancy bank building, not historically significant, just a square building built in the 60s or early 70s where my parents deposited checks or withdrew their money. At the drive through every time after my mother completed her depositor withdrawal and without asking, the teller placed three lollipops in the drawer for the three little girls in my mother's small blue Toyota. Over and over again, I thought of that, I wrote about it. I couldn't think why this mattered. That simple interaction, that casual, easy kindness. I don't know, probably she was a white teller. Maybe the action had been done before and after segregation. And we children accepted that kindness without a second thought. We were part of a new generation in which we would grow up to expect equal treatment. We would accept the lollipops without question. The teller and my mother had moved through that change, if not a literal change in the distribution of candy to children, the change in the actual context in which that candy courtesy occurred. As Mayor Landrieu said so movingly on the decommissioning of the Robert E. Lee statue, it's true that the city was not established with our well-being in mind, my family's well-being. And yet we thrived then and now. To be honest, though, we were not the only individuals or group of people in the city that care forgot that the city didn't actually care that much about. New Orleans has always been a hard, hard place. It had the highest death rate in the nation in the 19th century. It was a charnel house. Add to hurricanes, floods, and fires, yellow fever, malaria, and other more mysterious illnesses blamed on swamp gas and miasma. Then add the brutality of wars against Native Americans and their removal, the enslavement of Africans, the employment, if not conscription, of Europeans to build the colony in the 18th century, and then the infrastructure in the 19th. This was never an easy place to be either poor or wealthy. If there is one thing that binds all of us together on this land, across race and even across class, it is our history of the struggle to survive here. Yes, our resilience. To hear our fellow citizens in the North in the aftermath of, of Katrina complain about our lack of resilience is to witness a people that do not know our history or their own. Our history of carving a life out of one of the most unforgiving places on earth. Not every struggle is rewarded, and many that are rewarded are not rewarded immediately. Charles DeLonde and his soldiers for freedom lost their lives in 1811, but their sacrifice was redeemed only in 1865 when slavery ended. Generations of black New Orleanians had their dreams of a better life foreshortened by slavery and racism, and yet their struggle for equality has made this city and this nation a better one. For their redefinition of the Founding Fathers' original charge that all are created equal, that all are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, may the nation not only more open to people of African descent, but join them to the impoverished European immigrants who came here at the same time, to the struggle of religious minorities to make true the separation of church and state that will allow all of us to follow our spiritual paths, and don't think I have forgotten the sovereign Native American nations who will not completely subject to our laws continue to call upon this nation to live up to its best ideals, to recognize that we share the land and this world and that we can be better caretakers of each other and of our environment. The creation of our ideas of democracy and human equality are incredibly recent in human history, and we are in a constant, continuing struggle to realize these lofty goals. 
It is always the subaltern, the lower classes, the working classes, who truly form the foundation of our societies, with blood, sweat, and tears poured into our economies and into our physical landscapes, and sometimes with their bones lining the streets. Yet their contributions are repeatedly overlooked and to our detriment. We struggle to understand how to value the hot, sweaty work that is as key to a city's and a people's survival as the desk jobs and head work that makes sense of it all. Here in New Orleans, our great wealth has been rooted in these people and continues to be. If we valued it more, would more be willing to do it? I think so. Yet we are slow to appreciate that lesson. The working class, from enslaved Africans to laboring Europeans and free and freed blacks, to immigrants from around the world still coming here and everywhere today, the working class is at the foundation of this city. In the same way, this city is at the foundation of the success of this nation, the United States. New Orleans' charnel house of the nation was also New Orleans' queen city of the nation, alongside New York in the long 19th century. Both were capitals of national and world commerce, central to the nations and much of the world's success. The slave trade and cotton, as well as a range of other commercial goods, brought both cities inestimable wealth, and New Orleans and the South were actually wealthier as a whole than New York City and the North before the Civil War. The New Orleans free black community was itself wealthier than any other in the nation, and by a far margin. But that wealth, all of it, was built on an ancient system of slave labor that had evolved to a level of containment and cruelty out of step with new ideas of freedom, democracy, and humaneness. We are beginning to realize how that system and its toxic siblings, racism, naked economic greed, and social inequality ultimately limited the vision of places like New Orleans, even as they enabled much that was beautiful, even as they advanced science and culture and other great feats. We are beginning to realize and come to terms with how slavery birthed Jim Crow, an enormously inequitable carceral state, and the disproportionate impoverishment of black people, but also of southern people as a whole. We struggle to understand how racism and classism are intertwined and how enslavement devalued not only black human life, but all human life. For how else to explain the repeated underpayment of whites as well as blacks in the South? The resistance of southern states not to provide health care and schooling for all, not to create common wealth, the common wealth. The inability and unwillingness of elites in the South to share the wealth of this rich land. The struggle to part with the legacies of slavery and its toxic siblings and descendants is long. A century after the Civil War, as we've just heard about, after a long civil rights struggle, racial segregation finally crumbled. African Americans, freed from oppressive racism, made enormous economic and political gains, even as white massive resistance led to lawsuits and legal and extra-legal violence against such gains. The fact that today one-third or a little less of black Americans live below the poverty line continues to be problematic, no doubt about it. But the fact that two-thirds of African Americans are, are, are above the poverty line in 53 short years, my lifetime, since the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1965, is a testament to the resilience and the possibilities of people of African descent and the cooperation of many, even if not always enough, white allies. <laughs> Significant advances have been made. And the struggle we are currently in to, to refine our definitions of equity, of the commonwealth, of who is American, shows us how far we have come, but how far we also have to go. Yet I am hopeful that the advances we have made are strong enough to survive the current resurgence of racism we are experiencing. We're in it for the long game. Battles can be lost, but we will win the war. However, I fear and I know that we in this city must also deal with one final child of slavery. This child is one we almost want to believe is from another family, but she's ours. And it's this. The ways in which we change the landscape to adapt to our commercial needs means that we now sit in a very fragile position environmentally and politically. New Orleans, quite frankly, is under an existential threat. And unfortunately, the nation 
in denial of slavery and the importance of the city to its wealth, has reduced New Orleans itself to a coda to history and a place that the nation allegedly can do without. Let me tell a story that is both real and metaphorical to get us into this topic. A few years ago, I was at an academic conference here, part of a critical discussion of the history of the New Orleans economy and its recovery post-Katrina. A speaker heralded the tourism industry as a source of employment, as well as the resurgent restaurant industry, which has established many apprenticeship programs throughout the city to train the youth, largely I think the African American youth of New Orleans, for employment in the culinary field. Now let me be honest about myself, and I won't assume anyone else. The tourism industry, the reduction of our city to a playground for others and for the wealthy, is part of what drove me and perhaps others like me from the city in the 1980s and after. Feeling that we in the city, and particularly African Americans, were at the mercy of those with disposable incomes and those who supposedly needed unskilled or low-skilled, but more so low-paid labor. That put a ceiling on this population's possibilities, combined with the disemboweling of the public school education system. After the panel, I got into a brief conversation with someone about the limits of tourism, the limits of careers that cater to these, those with disposable income. Well, was the reply, if we can save at least one child, that will be something. Only one? As one of four daughters, my thought was, well, which one of us? Which three should be let go? As an aunt to five nephews, which one of my nephews should be saved? What of the other four? These kinds of ideas are part of what have informed hashtag Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement. A recognition that in our current time, Unlike the 17th or 18th centuries or the pre-Civil War era, we as a society profess to believe that all lives matter as a statement of our basic humanity as a society. But we are not sure how to live into that reality. How do we make all lives matter? How do we create a society in which, as Mayor Landrieu has said, we really are for the best and highest for all people? Now, I said that story tells of a reality but it is also a metaphor for one of America's great cities, New Orleans. For in the days and weeks after Katrina, while I was living in Atlanta, I was met with similar sentiments about this city. A close, oh, someone I thought was a close friend, a close friend said to me, well, perhaps we should just empty out the city, treat it as an historic site, like the Alamo, just relocate everyone, you can just visit it on vacation. Okay. Others, of course, blamed New Orleanians for living here. One Park Service employee in Georgia went on a long lecture while I was on a hike with him about the foolishness of those who supposedly chose to live here. Well, why does New Orleans exist, I asked. Well, it's an old city. Indeed, it's an old city, but they're all old cities. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Richmond, Charleston, Savannah, St. Augustine, Miami, Pensacola, Mobile, Houston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and let's not forget the islands that are also a part of our nation, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, many forget Guam, I almost forgot Guam, Hawaii. What makes some cities and places emblematic of a nation, distinctive but integral to it, while others are, as the sayings go, red-haired stepchildren, somehow illegitimate? New York, yes. New Orleans, no. Boston, yes. Miami, no. Houston, yes. Los Angeles, yes. Puerto Rico, mm-mm. Philadelphia, yes. Hawaii, no. For a long time, maybe these questions didn't matter much to New Orleans. The city has always prided itself on its difference from the nation, has always laughed knowingly when called the most un-American city, by which is meant the most non-U.S. city. The city most like the Caribbean or like Europe. In the aftermath of Katrina, I heard many people say, I've always thought of New Orleans as a third world city. That turned out to not be such a great thing as newscasters called evacuees refugees and the nation dithered on whether we should be saved. Unfortunately, I think we're in a similar situation again. As in the 19th century when New Orleans symbolized all that was wrong with slavery, today New Orleans symbolizes the worst possibilities of what can happen environmentally. But 
In the 19th century and today, what is not recognized nearly enough is that New Orleans is not unique in this problem. New Orleans, unfortunately for us, is but a canary in the coal mine. About a decade ago, I began teaching a course on the 2005 hurricane season. The first time I taught it, I had students from all over the nation, Boston, Chicago, California, and even a few from abroad, from Taiwan. I rooted the course in the history of the city. We would not reduce New Orleans to the Katrina moment in my class. We would know what the city was before the storm came. But the final question I asked them to think about in the course was, should the city be saved? Now, I know that sounds like a heartless question, but it's a necessary one because, believe me, it was being asked then and it will be asked again. My bright, optimistic students say, yes, without a doubt, the city should be saved. But then we began to talk again about why the city was in a, such a fragile situation. The man-made choices to drain the swamps to the north and to the east, to build man-made levees that imitated the natural ones, to expand the city into Lake Pontchartrain. As we heard this morning, we were actually standing in the middle of Lake Pontchartrain. Yes. In these ways, though, New Orleans is no different from any other city, I said. San Francisco's 1989 earthquake was so damaging in part because the wealthiest part of that city was built on landfill, which liquefied during the earthquake. New York City's shoreline today is not the shoreline that Europeans encountered in the 17th century. That, too, is landfill. Even Boston, and here my student from Boston started to look just a little queasy. Even Boston has substantial parts of it that are built on landfill. Many coastal cities are in fact very vulnerable, not just New Orleans. My Boston student couldn't take it anymore. What happened in New Orleans will never happen in Boston, he said. I know, I know, it's not the same city, I said. But my point is many cities have hidden vulnerabilities that we don't know about. It's not the same, he said, very upset. I wasn't able to convince him that New Orleans did not stand alone. But of course, in a few years, Mother Nature made the argument for me. Hurricane Irene struck New England a few short years later, and as far inland as Vermont and Binghamton, New York, forget the coast, floods and winds displace people from their homes. Hurricane Sandy forced out not only those on Long Island, but those in Manhattan as well, who began to realize that they were extremely vulnerable to flooding, and flooding not just from storms, but from encroaching sea level rise. Of course, Hurricane Harvey last fall passed over familiar hurricane territory, but with new ferocity, devastating flooding in Houston, revealing the ways in which that city's expansion had ignored floodplains, lower Florida, and of course, Puerto Rico. And other locations in this nation are subject to the slower, less dramatic, but no less devastating impact of sea level rise. Just before I arrived here, I read a detailed article about the decline of land in the San Francisco Bay Area, accelerated by both sea level rise and by land compression that resulted from the extraction of water from underground aquifers. The empty aquifers are compressing and the land is settling as a result. So we may ask, and the nation may ask, can New Orleans be saved whither New Orleans? But if we ask whither New Orleans, we must also ask whither Boston and New York and Philadelphia, whither Washington DC, whither Charleston and Miami and Houston, whither San Francisco, and really whither Hawaii and Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands and Guam. Indeed, whither a nation that imagines the loss of any part of itself as possible or easy without great loss to its integrity. And I mean integrity in every sense of that word, its wholeness, its history, its morality. Indeed, what is this nation's ethical responsibility to all of its people? And will it truly rise to meet that challenge? Now, I'm just an historian, and we're not good predictors of the future. But I'm also a true native New Orleanian. So yes, I do have a spiritual therapist who's a psychic. <laughs> and as I was thinking about this question, this existential question, I consulted her. Because I was like, wait a second. So I said, I asked her if she could tell me what was going to happen with New Orleans. Will the city survive? Now, I didn't want to know the answer before giving this talk. Because I'm, I'm not ready to know. But I wanted to know if at some point, she would be able to tell me the answer to my question if I had the courage to ask her and to hear the answer. So she gave me an answer that I hold close and it gives me a little bit of hope. And I'm going to tell you, of course. 
She said, such a question of the survival of a city is very complex. There's so many moving parts and many possibilities. So many things can change. With such a complex question, the only way to approach the truth is to ask the question over and over, over many months and even years, and see how the answers to that question line up, because the answers change. What this also means, though, is that there is the possibility of change. There's no fixed answer to this question. I took great hope from that answer, actually. I say to you, we must continue to ask this question then. Whither New Orleans? What will enable us to survive for another 300 years? Will we be Atlantis or Cortez? But asking these questions is not the final act, it's only the beginning. As we seek the answers to these questions, we also begin to walk the path of survival. We must do the work of resilience. We've been here before. We have given our lives to this before. We can do this again. But we must not close our eyes to what might be. We must walk forward, eyes wide open, strong and sure. And if we must, in the end, hide ourselves from the barbarians as did the people of Cortez, we will sing in our chains like the sea. But that's not the final answer, not now, not yet. We're nowhere close to that. Now, it's true that many of us who struggle for a different outcome today may not live to see it. I don't expect to live to see it. I hope I don't live to see it, actually. But what I can tell you as an historian of this city is that we are rooted in a history of enormous resiliency. We have an enormous capacity for change. We can lead the nation to a new future, and indeed, we must. I guess I'm asking you this as a selfish prodigal daughter. I kind of do want to come back. I don't need a fatted calf, don't do that. You don't have to do that. But I just want to walk these streets and hug my family and say hello to people sitting on their stoops. I want to sweat under this cloudy sky. I want to visit the graves of my ancestors and lay my weary bones next to theirs when the time comes. A few years ago, I was fortunate to spend my first expended time in New Orleans as an adult, eight whole months. Out on my morning walk, I heard a man call out to me, hey, where are you from? I paused for a second, where was I from? I lived in England, in New York, San Francisco, DC, and Atlanta. Where was I from? I'm from here, I finally said, but I've been away a long time. Well, welcome back, baby girl. Welcome home. Thank you for welcoming me home. <laughs> <laughs>